Today I want to talk about the precious blood of Jesus, and I've entitled it, When I See the Blood. You see, the blood of Jesus is the most powerful, cleansing, saving, healing, change agent that there is, and it speaks for all eternity. Amen. And you know, as we celebrate Easter this week, it's a momentous week because it actually coincides with the Jewish Passover season, and it's interesting because the very first Passover, they found themselves in their homes, much like we are today. And many people have drawn the similarities between Passover 2020 and the very first Passover. There was a headline this last week that said, Passover Eve, all of Israel to fall under full curfew for the first time since the plagues. Now that's powerful. There are so many prophetic pictures that are relevant to what we're going through right now. Pictures of the powerful blood of Jesus that takes away the sin of the world. You know, during the first Passover, there was a plague that broke out that killed all the firstborn. Now we're seeing a global plague that's killed thousands. I heard a Jewish rabbi talking about one of the Passover rituals. And in the Passover ritual, there's a place where everybody has to wash their hands. What are we doing today nonstop? We are washing our hands until our hands are chapped and dry. That first Passover, the children of Israel were instructed to take the blood of a lamb and sprinkle it on their doorpost, and they would be saved. Exodus 12, 13 says, but the blood on your doorposts will serve as a sign, marking the houses where you are staying. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. This plague of death will not touch you when I strike the land of Egypt. Today we celebrate the powerful blood of the spotless lamb of God, which is more powerful than any other shed blood of any lamb. And we are rising in faith as Christians all over the world to declare and decree an end to this plague, to this pandemic. We're applying the blood to our own personal guilt, the guilt of our family, and even the guilt of our nation. And we're applying it and we're standing together to declare the victory of the cross and the victory of the blood over this plague, over this coronavirus. It's, you know, in the time when the Israelites came out of Egypt, there were four evil decrees that Pharaoh made to them. And you know, he's the type of the enemy. And I see some similarities in what we're going through today. First of all, he decreed that they would be slaves. They would not be free to do what they wanted to do, but just exactly as they were told. What I see today is the enemy attempting to enslave many of us in fear, in panic, in bondage, in worry, in anxiety. But God is more powerful. Amen. His blood was shed. He is redeeming us from that. Pharaoh also ordered the Hebrew midwives to kill the boy babies. And when that didn't work, he said, okay, well, then drown any boy babies in the Nile River. And then he ordered the Israelites. They already had to make bricks. But then he added to their terrible burden. And he said, now you not only have to make bricks, but you have to find the straw and collect the straw to make the same amount. So he did exactly what the enemy has always tried to do kill, steal, destroy by whatever means he can. Yet, when God freed his people, he led them out. He promised four things to us, and he is saying those same things to us in the situation that we find ourselves in. And this is found in Exodus 6, 6 through 8. Therefore, say to the people of Israel, I am the Lord. I will free you from your oppression. I will rescue you Amen. from your slavery in Egypt. I will redeem you with a powerful arm and great acts of judgment. I will claim you as my own people and I will be your God. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God who has freed you from your oppression in Egypt. I will bring you into the land I swore to give to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I will give it to you as your very own possession. I am the Lord. Now, the promises that God is making to us today are because of the shed blood of Jesus. I will free you. I will free you from this oppression. I will rescue you from your slavery of fear. I will redeem you with a powerful arm, and I will bring you into your promised land, and I'll give it to you as your own possession. 
When Moses and Aaron first went to the children of Israel and made these declarations, they had a really hard time believing it. It sounded too good to be true. The brutality of the situation that they had been in, the brutality of their slavery, had so discouraged them that they could not even hope, they couldn't even believe. And people today have been totally traumatized by the season that we're in because of the cruelty of the devil. The devil has done this. He's gone around seeking who he might destroy. He's looking to destroy by whatever means he can, but I want to say something this morning. I want to declare that the same God who opened up the Red Sea so that the Israelites could pass through, he's opening up the Red Sea of his shed blood so that we can pass through and be saved, redeemed, set free from any plague that the enemy would throw against us. One more beautiful prophetic picture. It has to do with the Passover, and it's starting in Joshua 5. I'm going to tell you this beautiful story. It has come so alive to me in these last days. Now, this is when the Israelites were getting ready to go in and take the promised land. They had already come out of Egypt. They had already wandered in the wilderness, and they were camped on the plains of Jericho. And you know that Jericho was the first city that God gave them, and they were getting ready to go in. But first, before they could do that, at God's command, he told Joshua to circumcise the males. Then the Lord said to Joshua something very interesting after Joshua had obeyed and done that. He said, today, and this is in verse 9, today I have rolled away the shame of your slavery in Egypt. Now, I thought that was very interesting in timing that he would say that. Because keep in mind, they hadn't conquered anything yet. They hadn't done anything but wander in the wilderness. All they had done was stand and listen to the the Lord God Almighty. And what he said was, return to me. Return in a covenant relationship. And And this circumcision was symbolic of a covenant relationship of returning to God. And that's why their shame was rolled away. And that's why our shame is rolled away too when we enter into the covenant relationship with God and this place was called Gilgal and they celebrated Passover right there before they went in why does it astonish me that Passover was coming right before this momentous victory God always synchronizes what he does with the Jewish calendar it is amazing and then the Lord appeared to Joshua and this was the first time that he had a personal encounter with God since he had taken over the leadership. And he saw the Lord God Almighty who stood there with a sword in his hand. He appeared as the commander of the army. Remember, they were getting ready to go in and march around the walls of Jericho. And if you recall, when the spies went in, they had been hidden by a prostitute named Rahab. And Rahab believed in God. Rahab made some powerful declarations. She said, the Lord, your God is powerful. He's the only God. He's giving you the victory. And would you save me and my household? And the spies told her, yes, we will. But you've got to hang a scarlet rope from your window. She didn't put blood, but this scarlet rope was the picture of the blood being applied to that house. And so she was saved, and God did not only roll away the shame of the children of Israel, but he rolled away her shame. She was saved because of the blood, because of her faith in God, and it changed her life and her family's life forever. And then she became a direct part of the lineage of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Now that's redemption. That's change. That's liberating power. Mm-hmm. Joshua 5, 13 through 15, it talks about this encounter. When Joshua was near the town of Jericho, he looked up and he saw a man standing in front of him with a sword in his hand. Joshua went up to him and demanded, are you friend or foe? Neither one. He replied, I am the commander of the Lord's army. At this, Joshua fell with his face to the ground in reverence. I'm at your command, Joshua said. What do you want your servant to do? The commander of the Lord's army replied, take off your sandals for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did as he was told. Why do I bring up this particular account? I believe that we as a nation are standing right here, right where Joshua was. We're returning to God. We're applying the blood. I don't know if you've noticed, but I have seen many people 
actually putting red bows on their doors and red bows in their windows and red bows on their cars. Mm -hmm. They are recognizing on whatever level that it's the blood of Jesus mm -hmm. that frees us from every plague and every torment. Mm -hmm. But the Lord, the commander of the army of God is standing before us with his sword drawn as the captain of the host. We've been in a period where we've been on a pause, a pregnant pause I talked about. That pregnant pause is when there's a pause in the action to really emphasize the importance of what's coming next. And I believe that what's coming next is America returning to God with all of her heart. Mm. Full-scale revival. Revival among the leaders. Joshua had a personal revival. And as I've been living this account, even this week, the Lord has revealed himself to me in a much deeper way as commander of the host. He is powerful. He is leading us into battle. We will see every foe, every coronavirus, every enemy destroyed because our captain goes before us God is reviving us when the rugs pulled out from under us like it has been when things we counted on are gone we suddenly are in a place where we are ready to return to God with all our hearts last week something very interesting happened President Trump tweeted out that he was going to be watching the live stream of a service in Riverside California Harvest Christian Fellowship and because he tweeted that out, the pastor, Greg Laurie, later reported that because of that, they had 1.3 million viewers and over 11,000 people saved. Last, that was just last Sunday. God is doing something. He is up to something. What the enemy meant for evil is going to backfire on him. Amen. God is setting us up, this nation up, for a divine turnaround. He's standing before us with his sword drawn, and he's saying, people of God, rise up. I go before you. You will see every foe defeated, including this coronavirus, and I will claim you as my people people and I will be your God. May it be so. Happy Resurrection Sunday. He is risen indeed. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Praise the Lord. For as long as I can remember, we would begin a Resurrection Sunday morning, an Easter Sunday morning, by someone in leadership standing behind the pulpit and saying the words, he is risen, and then all over the congregation, the people would respond Exactly, in the words of Pastor Miriam, he is risen indeed. Let's try that wherever you are. He is risen. Amen, I can hear you. Praise the Lord. So today, I want to give you two things as quickly as I can. The first one is the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ is proof positive that there is life after death. This is different than raising the dead. Lazarus was raised from the dead as a sign Jesus said to his sisters, I am the resurrection and the life. And do you believe that? Do you believe that your, your brother can live? And Lazarus was raised up as a sign pointing to something that would be greater. Resurrection from the dead is something that results in eternal life. All those who were raised from the dead in the Bible were raised from the dead simply to die a death at a later date. They had died, they were raised from the dead as a sign pointing to the fact that God has the power of the resurrection. And those people all died and they're all waiting to be resurrected. So you see the difference between being raised from the dead in a miraculous sign pointing to Christ, pointing to the power of God, and then ultimately what will happen when all the dead are raised to life. There are different philosophies that try to negate this. There are people who believe that once you're dead, you're dead. They believe in something that would be called annihilation. You're just, uh, you're just done with. There's just nothing after death. Uh, the root of the word annihilation is, is the same root from which we get nihilism, which is a philosophy that there's no meaning in life. There's no purpose in life. That there are no morals. There are no standards. There are no, there's no authority. Uh, there's just nothing. It's, it, life is without uh, any purpose whatsoever. And there are people that actually believe that. They would like to believe that. Uh, I'm sure that people like, uh, for instance, uh, great villains in history such as Adolf Hitler thought that I'll commit suicide and uh, my body will be destroyed and 
they'll never be able to try me. I'll never be judged for any of the things that I've ever done. I'll just, it'll just all be over with. And after that, there will just simply be nothing. Uh, there are people who believe in reincarnation. They believe that there's some kind of life after death, that the soul will go into another body or uh, take on another human form or it will take on an animal form or even become a plant, a tree, for instance, and that as you go through all the different cycles of life that you'll just die and be reborn and die and be reborn. It's uh, the root of uh, religions like Buddhism. And so people think that they can come back and they think that they have lived in past centuries and they actually believe in this. But uh, the Bible gives us uh, clearly uh, the truth related to the power of the resurrection, the meaning of the res resurrection, and the importance to us who hold faith in Jesus Christ and believe the Word of God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the Apostle Paul says, Dear friends, let me give you clearly the heart of the gospel that I preach to you, the good news that you've heartily received and on which you stand. For it is through the revelation of the gospel that you're being saved if you fasten your life firmly to the message I've taught you unless you've believed in vain. For I have shared with you what I have received and what is of utmost importance. The Messiah died for our sins, fulfilling the prophecies of scriptures. He was buried in a tomb and was raised from the dead after three days as foretold in the scriptures. Then he appeared to Peter, who was called the rock, to the 12 apostles. He also appeared to more than 500 of his followers at the same time, most of whom are still alive as I write this, though a few have passed away. Then he appeared to Jacob or James and to all the apostles. Let's continue on in that same chapter. We'll skip down a little bit. For if there is no such thing as a resurrection from the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, all of our preaching has been for nothing, and your faith is useless. And if Christ is not alive, you're still lost in your sins, and your faith is a fantasy. If the only benefit of our hope in Christ is limited to this life on earth, we deserve to be pitied more than all others. But the truth is, Christ is risen from the dead as the first fruits of a great resurrection harvest of those who have died. So we want to establish that the resurrection is a fact. Jesus is living proof of the resurrection. He was seen by Peter. He was seen by the apostles. He was seen by 1,200 people at one time. James saw him. All the rest of the people that followed Christ had an opportunity to be uh, able to experience his presence alive after he was crucified, dead, buried for three days, and then raised from the dead by the power of the Holy Spirit. He's proof positive that death is not the end. He's proof positive that we're not just going to experience a cycle of, of dying and then living again in some other form. And Jesus establishes that very clearly. And the Bible tells us that all of our preaching is nothing, that the whole gospel message is nothing. We might as well shut everything down if Jesus hasn't been raised from the dead. If our Savior is not alive, how can he save us? If our Savior is not alive, how can he heal us? Dead men don't heal. Dead men don't save. Dead men don't have power. How can we proclaim his power? How can we proclaim the message of the gospel? Where is the hope if Christ has not been raised from the dead? And we have proof after proof after proof, testimony after testimony after testimony that Christ is alive. So living proof has been supplied to us that the resurrection is a real phenomenon, that the dead will be raised again. And the Bible says that Jesus is the first among those. And then, then there'll be a mass resurrection that is, that is going to take place at a later time. If we believe in the resurrection, if we accept that, if we celebrate that, if we proclaim that, if we preach that, it's impossible for us to do that without believing also in what comes after that. There are judgments that will come after the resurrection. There are judgments containing rewards for those who die in Christ. And there are judgments for those who die in their sins. 
And there are two separate thrones, two separate judgment seats from which these judgments will be meted out and there will be rewards of one kind or the other. And so the Bible tells us that every human being is appointed to die once. So reincarnation is completely out. You're not coming back as a dog or a cat. You're not coming back as a person. You're not coming back as a plant. You're not going to be a tree in a forest someplace. Reincarnation is off the table. The resurrection is a fact. Jesus is living proof of the resurrection. The scripture says that every human being has an appointment with death once, and then they will face God's judgment. The Bible continues to say, for we believers will be called to account and must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may be repaid for what has been done in the body, whether good or bad. That is, each will be held responsible for his actions, purposes, goals, motives, the use or misuse of his time, opportunity, and abilities. So we'll stop right there. If you're listening to this and you're a believer, you're a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Bible tells us very clearly that every one of the believers will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Every life will be examined. Everyone will have to give an account of the stewardship of all of the gifts that were given to them by God. Their time, their talents, their treasure. What did you do with the call of God on your life? How did you handle the things that God gave you and entrusted to you? And we'll all have to give an account. And when you think about this, uh, the apostle Peter is going to stand before the Lord and give an account of his apostleship. Billy Graham is going to stand before the Lord and give an account of his stewardship of the evangelistic calling and ministry and anointing upon his life. Every single person, every person that you would consider to be a saint, every individual that we read about in the Bible that was a follower of Jesus Christ, all the characters in the book of Acts, every single person from cover to cover is going to stand before the Lord and they're going to have to give an account of their stewardship of life the life that they lived on earth. And that is a fact. That is absolutely going to happen. Everyone will be resurrected. All of the believers for all time will stand before the Lord and judgments will be meted out. Rewards will be meted out. My wife and I were talking about this the other day and the scripture tells us that there's no marriage in heaven. So we were thinking, well, I wonder where, where we'll be situated and if we're not living under the same roof, maybe we'll have uh, a place in heaven side by side. And, and uh, I jokingly said, well, what if your, your, uh, your place is, is bigger than mine? You know, what if your reward is greater and you get to live in a, in a bigger, nicer place than me? And how, how's that going to How's that gonna be? And then she came back and she said, well, but, but what if your place is, is, is closer to the throne than mine? What if you get to live closer to the throne than I get to live closer to the throne? We speculate about this stuff. Sometimes we joke about these things. And, and none of us know exactly how it's going to be. But what we do know for sure is that we're going to be judged. That our life is going to be before the Lord as an open book. And we're going to have to give an account of our life serving God, living for God, our stewardship of the call of God on our lives. Right now would be a good time for all of us to consider judging ourselves. Am I living for Christ? Am I serving the Lord? How am I handling the resources that he has given to me? How am I investing my time? How am I investing my life? Am I doing what God's called me to do? Or am I living a life that is, is sort of in denial of the call of God? Am I delaying the call of God? Well, someday I'll do it. Or are we running away from the call of God? Like Jonah ran away from the call of God when God called him to go to Nineveh. Are we serving the Lord with a whole heart? Are we passionate about the kingdom of God? The resurrection is proof positive that all of us are going to be raised from the dead. Jesus is first and then everyone else comes afterward. And we're all going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And we're all going to give an account of our lives. And then the Bible continues on and says, I saw a great white throne and the one sitting on it. The earth and the sky fled from his presence, but they found no place to hide. I saw the dead, both great and small, standing before God's throne. And the books were opened, including the book of life. And the dead were judged according to what they had done, as recorded in the books. 
The sea gave up its dead, and death and the grave gave up their dead, and all were judged according to their deeds. Then death and the grave were thrown into the lake of fire. This lake of fire is the second death, and anyone whose name was not recorded in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. This gives a picture of what the resurrection will be like for those that die in their sins, for those that reject the grace of God, the love of God, the plan of God for their lives. It tells us exactly how they're going to respond. And the Bible says that even the natural elements will flee from the presence of a holy God. And those that have been raised from the dead are going to be raised from the dead regardless of where they died. We think that, well... Uh, if I'm cremated, then God can't judge me. If I'm cremated, then I won't be raised from the dead because I'll return to the dust. I just have to tell you that it doesn't matter uh, what ground you're buried in. It doesn't matter what sea you're buried in. It doesn't matter how long ago that took place, centuries ago, millennia ago. The Bible says that the Lord is going to raise the dead. And they're going to be raised to stand before him at the great white throne of judgment. And the reaction of everyone at that resurrection, the reaction of everyone standing before that throne is going to be to hide if they possibly can, but they will find no place to hide. There is no hiding place. There are people that we feel have gotten away with murder, and they weren't judged, and they died, and so death somehow has robbed justice, and they'll never have to answer for their sins. They'll never be arrested. They'll never be uh, tried in a court of law. There'll be no human judge that will ever be able to sentence them and be able to give them what it is that they deserve. And there are people that are sometimes despairing and they feel like, well, there is no justice. And I have to tell you that there is going to be justice meted out. And the righteous judge will sit on that great white throne. And all the dead, both great and small, are going to stand before that great white throne of judgment. They're not going to be able to run away. They're not going to be able to skip bail and hide someplace. They're not going to be a fugitive from justice anymore. And perhaps millennia have passed. And they never were judged here on the earth, but they have a date with the judge. And that date is going to come. The Bible says that after we die, after that appointment with death, then the judgment comes. And that is an absolute fact. That is going to happen. And they're going to stand before the Lord of all, the righteous judge, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the one that died on the cross so that their sins could be forgiven, the one that they rejected, the one that they refused to believe, they're going to stand before that one and they're going to see him in his glory and he will judge the living and the dead. And so we're going to see this take place. This is absolutely going to happen. So it covers all of us, doesn't it? If you die in faith, you're going to stand before the Lord. And the Lord is going to judge you for the stewardship of the call of God, the, the things that he gave you, the opportunity that he gave you to use everything for his glory. You're going to be judged for that. I'm going to be judged for that. Billy Graham will be judged for that. The Apostle Paul will be judged for that. The Apostle Peter will be judged for that. All of us will stand before, before that judgment seat. And then the great white throne judgment will be for those that in life rejected the Lord. They rejected the Lord, and we see what the result of that rejection is. The result of that rejection is eternal separation from God. The Bible says that the Lord is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. The opposite of that is complete darkness. It's the absence of light. And the Bible says that those whose names are not found in the book of life, because they never put their hope and their trust in Christ, even though they were given the opportunity to do so, they were allowed to exercise their free will and they chose to reject Jesus. And after making that choice and dying in their sins, it's not over. The resurrection is proof positive of that. They will be raised again. They will be raised again to stand before the Lord. And as their names are not found in the Lamb's book of life, the Bible says that they will be thrown into the lake of fire. We don't like to preach hellfire and brimstone. We feel like that belongs in the 18th century. You know, that belongs back in the day. Preachers used to talk that way. But how, how much better does the good news sound to you and to all of us, knowing what we're saved from, knowing that we're saved from something that was never 
created for us. There had to be a place made for the devil and for his angels. That's what hell is for. That's where the devil and his angels will spend eternity just prior to the verse that I just finished reading in Revelation. The Bible talks about the judgment coming upon the enemy and about the fact that he will be cast into that pit and cast into that fiery hell. But that was created for him. It was never created for human beings. Human beings were created in the image of God. Human beings were created with the opportunity to exercise free will for their entire lifetime and give it an opportunity to be able to have faith and to understand the Lord. My responsibility is not to make you believe something or to try to manipulate you into putting your faith in God's word. I'm just here to tell you the truth. There is heaven and there is hell. And the resurrection is going to be the place where every single person will come truly to grips with the reality of what they're listening to right now. That is going to happen. Jesus is proof positive of that. You've got a free will that God has already given to you. He's not going to take that away. You can choose what to believe and what not to believe. That's never going to change. It's up to you to choose what to believe. I've chosen to put my faith and trust in Christ, to believe the Word of God, to believe the evidence of Scripture, to believe the testimony of Scripture that Jesus is indeed alive. I serve a risen Savior. He's the living God. I choose to believe what the Word of God says when it says that I should honor the Lord and I should serve the Lord with a whole heart and love Him with all of my heart. I choose to believe that there are rewards for that. There is the reward in this life of being able to live a life that is an abundant life. Even in the midst of all the trouble that we're experiencing, God has abundant life for every believer. I choose to believe that. God gave each one of us a measure of faith, each person has the ability to live by faith in something. You get to choose and I get to choose what we're going to invest our faith in. Every time you get on an airplane, you're making an investment of your faith in the mechanics that serviced it, in the people that loaded it with luggage, in the pilots that pilot it, in the control tower that's going to guide it. You have put your faith and invested your faith in all of these things. Every single person uses faith every single day when they get in their automobile and drive down the road. Faith that they're going to be able to get there and they're going to be able to do a good job of handling the automobile and so is everyone else. You get to choose. I choose to invest my, my faith in a Savior who is alive. My calling is to proclaim the good news and I'm proclaiming it as strongly as I can this morning on Resurrection Sunday morning, Easter Sunday morning. Jesus is alive. Let me say that again. Jesus is is alive. We have living proof. The resurrection is living proof that Christ lives. He was resurrected never to experience death again. He wasn't just raised from the dead like Lazarus was raised from the dead and lived a few more years and then died natural, a natural death. Once he was raised from the dead, he was raised from the dead never to die again, never to experience death again. It was a one-time sacrifice of his life that doesn't need to be repeated and never will be repeated. He was crucified, dead, buried, resurrected so that you could be saved and born again as a child of God. You could live in a perfect relationship with him, not just in this life, but forever. His resurrection proves that you and I are going to be resurrected someday too. He's first, and then everyone else will come after that. And when that happens, you're either going to stand before him having received his saving grace and died in faith, or having rejected him, and died in your sins. There are two things that are certain. The dead will live again. And the other thing is that everyone who was dead and been made alive again will receive their final judgments and their eternal sentences. For those who die in Christ, the righteous judgment is eternal life. For those who die in their sin, the righteous judgment is a second final death. Every soul will experience conscious separation from God for all of eternity. You've heard it said, and perhaps in church, that if you're born once, you will die twice. But if you're born twice, you will only die once. If we're born again through faith in Jesus Christ, 
then the death of our physical body will be the last death that we'll ever experience. If we die in our sins, then we're going to experience death a second time. This time it won't just be the separation of our soul from our body, but it will be the separation of our soul in conscious, conscience awareness for all of eternity from all that is light, all that is life, all that is the goodness and grace of God. That is a reality. That's what makes the resurrection so incredibly wonderful and such powerful good news for us. It just simply means that what we were promised is actually going to come to pass. And because Jesus has been raised from the dead, we also have nothing to fear from death. The resurrection destroys my fear of death. The same Holy Spirit that raised Christ from the dead is going to raise me up also. The same Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is going to raise you up also. The resurrection also means that my Savior is alive. Christ rose from the dead. He's alive. So that means that he has all power to keep every one of his promises to me of eternal life with no sin, no sickness, no sadness, and no separation. A dead man can't keep promises. A dead man can't keep the, the commitments that he's made to others. That's all over with. But Jesus isn't dead. Jesus is alive. So every commitment that he has made to me and every commitment that he has made to all of us who trust him and love him, every promise in the scripture, he is alive and able to fulfill and he is fulfilling promise after promise after promise in our lives. On that first resurrection day, the responses varied. Some people rejoiced greatly and then some people were filled with fear, with dread, and with a desire to make it all go away. The guards who had been assigned to guard Jesus' tomb raced into the city. Some of them, I think, ran away because not all of them went to the leaders, the Jewish leaders who had uh, requested them from Pilate. They were Roman guards. They ran to the Jewish leaders. They didn't run to the Roman officers because they knew that the penalty for losing the body and for the tomb being tampered with and the guards not in interfering and stopping it, the penalty for that would be death as far as their military authorities were concerned. So they went to the religious authorities who were the Jewish authorities who didn't have the power to put them to death to see if they could work something out. And they testified to them that the tomb was empty. The body was gone. They saw the angel. Uh, when they saw the angel, they, they, uh, they, they fell down as, as if they were dead. They just literally passed out for fear and passed out because of the presence of this angel at the tomb. And you can imagine what that must have been like for the religious leaders that thought that they had resolved the problem and they had dealt with the problem of Jesus and they were done with him and they had rejected him they had railroaded him through a phony trial and crucified him on a cross, and then they had put him in a tomb, and it was over. You can imagine the dismay. You can imagine the fear. You can imagine the dread. You can imagine the desire that they had to wake up from this nightmare for it to just all go away. But no one could make it go away. Even though they bribed the guards and told them to lie, no one could make the truth and the proof disappear. 500 people saw him. Peter saw him. The apostle James saw him. All of the apostles saw him. He was alive. The tomb was empty. The resurrection was an accomplished fact. No one can change it. No one can make it go away. They couldn't make it go away then, and they can't make it go away now. I want you to be honest with yourself when you think about the resurrection of Jesus Christ, when you think about what comes after the resurrection, the Bible says that it's appointed unto a man once to die, and then after that comes the judgment. And of course, the judgment won't be over a dead body. The judgment will be over a living soul that has been resurrected from the dead. When you think about standing before the Lord, if you're a Christian, what do you think? If you're not a believer, if you've rejected Christ's offer of salvation and God's mercy and God's grace, everything that he's done to make sure that you would be able to have eternal life and you would be able to have eternal life with him if you've rejected that. When you think about the resurrection and the fact that 
once you're dead, you won't stay dead. You're going to be raised up. You're not going to escape anything, even if you escape all judgment in this life and all accountability in this life. Never have to answer for a thing in this life. You're going to be raised again, even after you die. Everyone will. And you're going to stand before the Lord. You're going to stand before the Lord, and it will be the great white throne of judgment. It will be the other judgment seat. The other judgment seat. And that judgment seat will not be a judgment seat from which rewards will be given, from which your Christian life will be evaluated because you never had one. That judgment seat will be an eternal one. And the result of that will be vastly different from the one that believers will experience when they receive the rewards of a faithful life, living for Christ and putting their faith and their trust in Him. So be honest with yourself. Which group are you in? Are you in the group that's rejoicing this morning that your Savior is alive, looking forward to seeing Him again face to face? Or are you, are, are you in the group that would have been symbolized by the Pharisees who hated Him, who rejected Him, who wanted to do away with Him, wanted it all to go away? I wish that this wasn't happening. I wish that I didn't have to think about this. Uh, I, don't want, I, don't want, I don't want to have to uh, imagine what that will be like. Depending on what group you're in will depend on how you respond. If you're a person today that is terrified of the resurrection, terrified of the fact that there is life after death, terrified of the fact that there is judgment that is going to come, then I've got an answer for you, and that answer is the Prince of Peace the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Jesus himself presented to you today. He's a living Savior. And he calls to every person. His voice is a voice that you can hear in your heart. And he's calling to you. And he's giving you an opportunity to put your trust in him today on this Easter Sunday morning. It would be tremendous if many of you who are listening to me today who are not saved would choose to put your trust in him. It would be awesome today if you would choose to believe that Jesus Christ loves you, that he died for your sins, that if you put your trust in him and receive him as your savior, you can be born again. You can have a, a brand new relationship with God that is real. You can have a brand new life in this life. It's called the abundant life in Christ. And then dying in Christ, you can have the expectation that resurrection for you will be awesome resurrection for you will be tremendous. It will be glorious. It will be a time of celebration, a time of fulfillment. It will, be, it will be something that you always knew was going to happen. And when you died in this life, you died in faith, believing that you weren't going to stay in that tomb, but God was going to raise you up in the last day. God was going to raise you up with awesome power to live forever and ever and ever and experience eternal life, eternal light, eternal joy, no sin, no sickness, no sadness or sorrow, no separation ever again. That's what Christ offers you today on this Resurrection Sunday. He's still saving souls. He's alive. He's the Savior. He's calling you today. If you're a Christian and you're not living for God, He's calling you too, calling you to repentance calling you to return, calling you to a place of revival, calling you to a place of, of real ministry in the body of Christ, serving Him. So I want to pray for you today, and I want to ask God to touch you today, and I want to ask you and challenge you today, in light of what you've heard, living proof has been supplied. You can't consider the living truth without considering the fact that after that resurrection, after the proof of that resurrection, the Bible promises that judgment will come. Judgment will come. And we want to be ready and be standing in faith in Christ when we stand before the Lord in judgment. I want you to be ready. I want you to get ready now in Jesus' name. Let's pray. Father, I pray for every single person, every single person that is hearing this message today. And I pray, Lord, that you would have mercy, and I pray that your grace would flood their heart. I pray, Lord, that the power of the Holy Spirit would come upon them right now, that every single person who has been a Christian and walked with the Lord and has, has backslidden and gone back into 
a lifestyle that they know is not pleasing to God. Lord, I pray for them today, and I thank you that your grace is on their lives. I thank you, Lord, that your promise is sure. If they confess their sins, you're faithful and just to forgive them of their sins and to cleanse them from all unrighteousness. And I pray right now, Lord, that many who are hearing my voice would be crying out to you right now and saying, Lord, forgive me, I'm a sinner. Restore me to right relationship with you. Christ, I receive your forgiveness. I receive your mercy. I receive your cleansing power. Heal me, cleanse me, deliver me from sin. And Lord, I pray that those that have never received Christ, maybe they've received communion, maybe they've received membership in church, maybe they've received baptism, they've received everything that religion has to offer, religious instruction, maybe go on to Christian schools, but they've never received Christ. They're missing one thing, and it is the thing. They're missing Jesus. Lord, I pray that they would receive Christ right now as their Lord and Savior that they would just simply pray this and say, Jesus Christ, I receive you by faith as my Lord and Savior. I receive you, Jesus, by faith as my Lord and Savior. I receive you. I receive you, Jesus. I receive you. Thank you, Lord, for your promise that as many as receive you, you will release power for them to become a child of God. Lord, I pray that that is happening right now in Jesus' mighty name. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord.